Hi everyone and uh, welcome to chapter 14 uh, which is about wave motion. Um, so in this topic we're going to talk a lot about uh, different types of waves uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some parameters like frequency and speed of uh, waves, specifically sound waves. And we'll talk a little bit about electromagnetic uh, spectrum as well. So what is wave motion? Uh, at a very basic level, at a very basic level, wave motion is about how you transfer energy from one place uh, to another. So it's th this topic is really about uh, transfer of energy. We're going to study the properties of waves, but at the end of it all, just remember you are trying to transfer energy from one point to another. For example, you have electromagnetic waves from the sun that will carry energy that uh, plants need to survive and to grow. And the energy uh, carried by sound waves causes our eardrums to vibrate. Um, you might have earthquakes and you have seismic waves and the energy that these seismic waves carry can devastate large areas, right? Like they can cause land to move or buildings to collapse. So essentially what we're trying to study here for the purposes of this chapter at least are what we call progressive waves. So as the name implies, you know, they're progressing, they're moving from the, the wave itself is moving from one point to another. So like if you see waves on the sea, that, that wave is not standing still. It is actually uh, moving from one point to another. So um, there is a um, there is a uh, another category of uh, waves and it is called stationary waves, um, which are also called standing waves sometimes. So we're going to cover sta stationary waves in uh, chapter uh, 15 uh, and I'm actually going to take some of the material from uh, the syllabus chapter 14 and put it into chapter 15 because I think it's more um, appropriate to discuss it in chapter uh, 15. So let us look at a couple of categories I guess uh, or classifications of waves. So the first kind of classification uh, that you would look at is something that looks like this. So assume uh, you have, you know, uh, a rope, it's just free, and you start moving it, moving it up and down, right? So the rope will take this kind of shape, right? So your hand is, let's say, at this point, and this end of the rope is free. So over the course of some time, you know, this is the shape that the rope would take. So you're moving your hand up and down this way, right? And this is the shape that the ropes, a rope end, ends up taking. So this kind of a wave uh, is called a transverse wave. Um, and some important things to note about uh, this guy is that, you know, the the wave itself is traveling in this direction, right? Direction of wave travel. Whereas the particles of this rope, oh, I beg your pardon, it shouldn't say particle, it should say motion. Um, the particles of this rope, the individual particles of this rope, let, let this guy here, right? He, this one is still moving up, whereas um, you have this part of the this part of the rope also still moving up. This particle right here, it's at the highest point it's ever going to get. It's actually going to start moving down now, right? So the, the 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 direction of the particle motion is perpendicular to the direction of the wave motion, which is why this kind of a wave is called a transfer wave. What else uh, could we have as a type of uh, um, uh, classification of wa uh, progressive wave motion. So now let us imagine that you have a spring of some kind, right? Uh, and I'm going to draw a few of these loops here so we can see, we can play around with this a little bit. So let's say you have a spring, right? And you are going to start compressing this spring and releasing it also. Like you're going to keep on going back and forth. So this is your uh, hand movement, right? So you're pushing the particles of the spring kind of like in this horizontal direction. So you know what's gonna happen. After a while, I'm gonna use a different color with this. Uh, after a while, you might see the um, spring look a little bit like this. So you have parts of the spring where the, uh, you know, the loops of the sp spring are farther apart. And then you have these kind of like, you know, they're very close together again, and then farther apart, farther apart, farther apart. All right, so you might see something uh, like that. So what you're doing is you're, inputting energy in, in in kind of this kind of a direction, right? You're inputting energy with your hand motion uh, in this direction. And the wave itself, this wave right here, the energy is being passed through the loops of the string uh, in this direction. So now this remains the direction of wave travel. But compared to the case we were looking at before, uh, the hand motion is in uh, the in the same um, 
uh, direction as the travel as the travel of the wave and as a result of that this kind of a wave is called a longitudinal wave So an easy way I found when I was a student, an easy way I found to remember the difference between the transfer, transverse wave and the longitudinal wave was that I would think of them as this one was like water waves and this one was like sound waves. That was the easiest way I could think of remembering it. Um, so the other way, and which is actually a more accurate way of remembering it, um, the is is like you know the the the, the um, direction of the motion of the wave is the same as the direction of the motion of the particle. Uh, I beg your pardon. Um, is uh, is perpendicular. It's perpendicular to the direction of the motion of the particles. That's a transverse wave, and then this guy longitudinal wave you have a wave and then the particles are also uh, moving uh, in the same kind of um, orientation so they might be going to the left they might be going to the right and the wave itself is moving towards the right as you saw in this in um, in, uh, in in this scenario here but as a, uh, but regardless uh, they are parallel to the direction of uh, the wave motion it's parallel one final point to uh, note down here so when you have particles in the case of longitudinal waves when you have particles that are uh, compressed together right here right so this piece here is actually called you guessed it a compression so when you have uh, in a longitudinal wave particles compressed together we simply call it a compression this is the more interesting name i thought because i couldn't easily understand uh, what that meant except just to say that the particles are farther apart from each other, but I couldn't relate it to any English word I knew, but this is called a rarefaction. So this piece here, when the particles are farther apart from each other, uh, we th than normal, I should say, uh, we, are call we call these uh, parts of the wave uh, rarefactions. So this is how longitudinal waves work. So let's take a look at what's happening to the displacement of particles in a wave uh, against time. And I guess uh, of all the particles at a particular moment in time. So let's look at a couple of graphs. So this first graph here, it basically illustrates what's happening to the the particles themselves over the course of time. Like how, uh, it, I beg your pardon, one single particle, what is it experiencing over the course of time? Um, so you have essentially this particle that was originally, you know, in, in its uh, starting point, it moves away from its starting point experiences a maximum displacement in one direction, returns back to its starting point here, and then experiences ma maximum displacement in another direction, and right back to its original starting point. So what we call this period here, um, that, that you have experienced from, let's call it point A to point D, um, we call that as the period T of this oscillation and this should be familiar to you from what we did in chapter 13. Uh, so you have uh, the period T of the oscillation. Sometimes people also like to measure from crest to crest, the crest of the wave to the crest of the next crest of the wave. They call it, uh, they call that, uh, use that to measure the uh, period also. So that's perfectly fine, uh, completely appropriate to do that. Now, what do you think is happening to all the particles at a given moment in time, at a given moment in time. So this might look a little bit similar to this. So you should, and I'll actually draw it the same way also. So here again, what we have is on in the um, on the x-axis, we're just gonna have displacement once again, right? We're gonna have displacement on the x, uh, I beg your pardon, on the y-axis. Uh, so on the, on the x-axis, I'm going to plot out, uh, I'm gonna call this uh, distance of wave travel. So if, if now you're looking at all the particles all at once at a, at, at a single moment in time, and the x-axis represents um, the dist how far the wave has uh, traveled. Um, so this would be the starting point of the wave, and this is as far as the wave has gone out over time. So the graph is actually gonna look pretty similar to, the, uh, to what you have seen so far. Uh, and uh, what, what, what this is then called, when you measure from peak to peak, this is called the wavelength right here. 
the length or, or, uh, the length of the wave basically right and it's do, mm, 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 uh, denoted by the greek letter lambda so lambda is the wavelength and you can also measure that as lambda from there apologize for the lack of scale on this graph but uh, that's that is also the same uh, way of measuring it now what do you think this is this guy right here this is how how much the, the, the max anything has gotten displaced from its uh, original starting point, right? So we call this the amplitude. Again, this should be familiar if you've watched the video on uh, chapter 13, but regardless, I'm going through it once again. So this is this is the amplitude, uh, and um, that, that essentially covers how the particle, a, a single particle is uh, experiencing this wave uh, over time. So that is the top graph here. And this is all particles at a moment in time. All particles at a moment in time. So a snapshot basically, right? Of all the particles at a moment in time. So let's just kind of uh, summarize what these different parameters are. So these are basically the parameters that we can use to describe a wave. So displacement, which can be denoted by the letter X, uh, is how far something has traveled from its uh, um, from its rest position. And amplitude is basically can be denoted by X naught, and that is the same. It's going to be meters again, but it's now the maximum uh, displacement that any particle uh, experiences from its uh, rest position. So X can be any number between zero and X naught for this wave. Period. Uh, it can be denoted by the term. Uh, by the letter t uh, and it is basically uh, time for uh, one complete uh, oscillation of this wave uh, and you can denote the the um, frequency with f which is the same as the inverse of uh, the period t again this should be familiar to you uh, from based on uh, what we experienced in uh, chapter um, 13. Now, we just figured out that frequency is the inverse of uh, the period, right? So this is basically per second, or it's also referred to as hertz. So essentially, the number of complete oscillations that of a particle in the wave per unit time, and hence per second or hertz. So we also discovered that wavelength is the distance between two points on successive oscillations of uh, this wave, like measured from crest to crest, or like from the uh, you know the initial starting point. Um, so th these are basically two points that are vibrating in phase, and I will explain what that means in a subsequent video. But for now, take it as a given that the wavelength is the distance between um, so lambda is distance distance between uh, particles between uh, particles on successive uh, oscillations uh, that are in phase. Particles in successive oscillations exactly in phase. So I want you to notice something here. The wavelength, the length of this wave, right? That's gotta be in meters. We know, we know this. Um, so can we now figure out the speed of this part, uh, this wave? Can we figure out a wave equation? Well, we certainly can, because what would this be if I have a velocity given as lambda, which is in meters, times frequency, which is per second? Wouldn't that work for us? In fact, it would. Uh, basically, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're saying that you can take the period of the oscillation and divide the wavelength with it. That's basically all that's referring to. So this, guys, is called the wave equation. Um, it essentially relates the length of the wave, uh, or the wavelength, uh, the period that it's oscillating at, or its frequency, with uh, how fast this wave is gonna be traveling. So if you have uh, a wave that uh, uh, is, um, uh, let's say, you know, the frequency of a wave is 280 hertz. 
for the sake of argument. And uh, this is, let's say, this is sound. Um, so it's uh, somebody's honked a horn or something like that, right, in, from their car. And the speed of sound is, um, is basically 300 meters per second. Uh, could you work out what lambda would be? Uh, I'll leave this one for you to do at home. Uh, but that is how you would go around figuring out what the wavelength of this uh, sound wave would be. Um, and actually, let me end this video by, let us talk about what it means to be exactly in phase. So let's end the video with a description of that. So let us assume for a second that we have uh, in the top graph, right? We have a wave that looks something like this. What if you have another wave that just starts just a little bit after in like, let's say you, you know, you dropped a stone in water and then a second later you dropped a second stone. So the, the variation, uh, the, the, the shape of that wave would look very similar, right? It would look a little bit like this, just kind of just be lagging a little bit, right? Be uh, in time behind the other wave. So it looks just a, just a tad bit uh, like this. So this kind of a wave is said to be out of phase. And we basically say that there's some kind of a phase difference. Essentially, when the relative positions of the crests and the troughs of these two waves are not aligned with each other, they are said to be out of phase. So in the second example, and I'll use a different color for this for a second, just so you can see the difference. Let us say, essentially, I'm gonna draw right on top of this guy, right? It's, you, it, 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 you drop two stones right next to each other at the same time in, in the water. Uh, and essentially, this guy is overlapping with the other guy, right? So in this case, you are said to be in phase or you know you're exactly uh, in phase in this kind of a situation what if um, you know a different scenario uh, has occurred uh, so maybe instead of uh, the, the, you had a friend underwater and they you know threw up a stone in the other direction uh, and uh, the it ends up generating a, a, a waveform that looks a little bit like this it looks like basically the mirror image right uh, of, uh, of, of, of what your, your first uh, few waves look like. So this is now said to be an antiphase. Now the quantitative measure of the, uh, you know, uh, of the phase difference is uh, 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 radians or degrees. It has a unit of angle. Uh, so when you have waves that are out of phase with a, with a, cr a crest uh, aligned with the trough, kind of like in this third example that we have here, uh, you, let me go back to my yellow color here. Uh, one wave is half a cycle behind the other wave. You can see that very clearly. It's about half a cycle uh, be, behind the other guy. So since one cycle, and I will refer you back to previous chapters, one cycle is roughly equivalent to two pi radians. The phase difference between these waves that are exactly out of phase is called pi, pi radians is the uh, is a phase radian, uh, phase difference, I beg your pardon, in, in this uh, situation. Uh, say, you know, let's, let's go back to the example at the top there. Um, so, and in this case, you know, your, your phase difference, uh, phase difference is equal to zero. They're fully uh, in phase with each other. So the top example is a little bit somewhere in the middle, right? Um, so let us say for the sake of argument that, you know, the time difference between these two guys is small t, right? And you know that it takes from crest to crest, this is the period t. The period t corresponds, as you know, if you remember from chapter 13, it's gonna to correspond to two pi, uh, the phase angle of two pi. So if you, wanna, if you wanna figure out what the phase difference is in this situation, well, it's quite simply, you know, gonna be 2 pi times uh, t upon the larger t, small t upon large t radians. That is, uh, that is the phase difference. Um, and you can, you can also kind of express this as uh, 2 pi times the out of state uh, step by a distance of x meters over the, the wavelength. So same idea essentially, right? Um, so in, instead of you, instead of looking at it from a time perspective, you can look at it from a uh, distance perspective as well.
So guys, that brings us to the end of uh, this chapter and it uh, looks like a pretty long video, I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, let's use this, uh, we, we've learned a lot here today. Uh, so let's use this to talk a little bit more about waves uh, and how does uh, energy get transferred in waves in our next video. So I'll see you in the next video, thank you.